Section 10.3, energy and subharmonic motion. Hope you're still feeling energized for this section. So note, a compressed spring can do work, right? If you have, for instance, a spring on a door, that, that can keep the door from closing as quickly so that it closes more gradually. The spring is reducing the kinetic energy. It's doing work here. How much work is it doing? Well, to take a look at it, we could say that the work done in this elastic spring force is the average force times cosine of the angle between the force and the displacement times the displacement. So the average force is just one half of the spring force at one point plus the spring force at another point uh, in terms of the magnitudes times cosine of zero because it's in the same direction as the displacement with the displacement being the initial position minus the final position. And when you multiply that out, you can show, you can get to this end result, which is the main important thing to take away from this, that you can calculate the work done by a spring in either stretching or compressing with one half the spring constant times the initial position squared minus one half the spring constant, the final position squared. Now, why is it initial minus final? That's kind of backwards of how things usually are. But it's because the spring force is doing positive work any time the spring moves from further away from its equilibrium into a final position that is smaller, that's closer to zero. So if you start out at a larger XO and move closer, the spring is doing positive work. It's moving, it's, the spring is moving in the direction it wants to go. Versus if you finish a position that is at a larger X, then you're going to be doing negative work by the spring. The spring is slowing down that motion. Since we can calculate the work done by a spring, this is also a good time to introduce the potential energy of a spring, how a spring can store energy. So this is known as our elastic potential energy. And our definition of elastic potential energy is the energy that a spring has by virtue of either being stretched or compressed. For an ideal spring, the elastic potential energy looks very similar to that work equation, right? PE elastic is one half kx squared. So this is a really handy equation. Anytime we have a spring that's stretched or compressed, it has potential energy, right? Where once again, x zero is the equilibrium point, x equals zero. So that's our default reference point, the unstrained length of the spring. And what's our unit of elastic potential energy? Well, it's that of any other energy, joules! So I'm quite a fan. So this is yet another energy term that we can add whenever we want to consider the total energy and how energy is conserved. Because more often than not, we're going to look at cases where energy is conserved. Right, so you want to keep this in mind. Let's look at a couple of examples here. So first, a conceptual example, changing the mass on a simple harmonic oscillator. The box rests on a horizontal frictionless surface. The spring is stretched to x equals a and released. When the box is passing through x equals zero, a second box of the same mass is attached to it without reducing the speed. Discuss what happens to the one maximum speed, two amplitude, three angular frequency. So I'd like for you to think this through for each of the three parts here. Come up with the answers for them before you move on. So go ahead and pause the video now. All right, I'm hoping you did that. This one's a tricky one. I, I had to think it through for a while and check my understanding of it. It gives some clues in how it asks the questions though, right? So it first asks about this maximum speed. For that, we could think, when does the maximum speed occur in the motion of our spring oscillating back and forth? Well, the maximum speed occurs in the middle, at the very center. Notice, when is the second box added? Right at x equals zero, in the middle of the motion. And it says it's added without reducing the speed. Since we're adding it without reducing the speed, that tells us that 
the maximum speed has been left unchanged in adding the second box because we were so careful in how we added that second mass. All right, so that's looking good. What then about the amplitude? Well, for this, we can start to think about if we've kept the maximum speed the same, what has that done to the energy? Well, in this middle point at x equals zero, our kinetic energy is going to be calculated with one half m v squared, and our v max is the same here, right? We could write this as max. But we've effectively doubled our mass here, right? It's twice as big. That means our kinetic energy, after this is added, is now twice as big overall. Well, what does that mean for the amplitude? For the amplitude, what kind of energy does it have? At the full displacement at the amplitude, how fast is it moving? It's not, right? So at that point, when it briefly stops, the kinetic energy is zero, and it becomes purely potential energy. Well, how do we calculate our potential energy? Careful, this is not gravitational potential energy, but elastic potential energy, because we're talking about the spring being compressed. So this case, it's gonna be one half k x squared, but we're at the full amplitude here, right? So instead of writing it as one half k x squared, our PE max, when it briefly stops, is one half k a squared. We are at the full amplitude. So this is our PE max. And if this is equal to kinetic energy that is twice as big, right, where the kinetic energy has increased by a factor of two, how is that going to affect everything over here? Well, the, the k has to stay the same. The amplitude then is going to get bigger. By how much will it be twice as big? Not quite because the amplitude is squared. So the amplitude will be equal to the square root of two times the original amplitude. So we can call this a zero. So the key here is that because we've increased our kinetic energy by increasing the mass without changing the speed, our amplitude will increase. That's the main takeaway. You don't need the math since it's a conceptual example, but it can be useful to actually see that. All right, finally, we also want to take a look at the angular frequency. Angular frequency. Remember angular frequency is equal to square root of k over m. So if we are doubling our mass, how is that gonna change our angular frequency? Since mass is in the denominator, our angular frequency then is going to decrease by one over root two. So hopefully that helps to introduce how some of these concepts work together in really interesting ways. This problem, the key is that it told us that it, the box was added at the maximum speed without changing the speed. So that was a key detail. From that, we could figure out how the amplitude changed and how the angular frequency changed. Let's look at a more quantitative example. So example eight, adding a mass to a simple harmonic oscillator. The 0 0.20 kilogram ball is attached to a vertical spring. The spring constant is 28 newtons per meter. When released from rest, how far does the ball fall before being brought to a momentary stop by the spring? Notice in this case, we now have a vertical spring. So if we want to start thinking about energy, now our gravitational potential energy is going to matter. We'll have both our elastic and our gravitational potential energy. And energy is a really good approach here, right? We could consider when uh, the ball is first attached, 
and released from rest, what kind of energy do we have here? Well, at this point, the spring is unstrained, so there's no elastic potential energy. It's released from rest, so there's no kinetic energy. So all that we have is our MGH, our gravitational potential energy. And then we drop it, and it starts to fall. And we aren't solving for the new equilibrium position after it like just is hanging out and doing nothing. We're solving for it falls and it briefly stops before starting to travel up again and then do this oscillation. So we're looking for this maximum displacement. In other words, we're looking for when the spring is stretched to its max. Right? This sounds like elastic potential energy and really the maximum elastic potential energy. So one half K A squared. Now we could notice that this is not at the ground level, right? It's not, it hasn't hit the ground to stop. So you could consider that at this point, it still has potential energy, except that we remember our gravitational potential energy is relative to whatever height we want to. So we can then say that this height is equal to zero. And we can measure the height that we start out at, h sub zero, relative to this lowest point of the motion. And this is often a really good approach in solving problems. So let's take a look at this. We're going to set the final energy equal to the initial energy. And here, I love this. This is everything that could be calculated in our energy, right? We have our linear kinetic energy, our rotational kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and our um, overall uh, elastic potential energy. Same thing with the initial. So let's start with the initial. We said it's starting at rest, so the velocity is zero and the angular velocity is zero. We also are at the unstrained part of the spring, so that's zero. So we just have mg times the initial height, which we're calling h0 relative to that bottom point. At this final point, we said that this is where our height is zero, so our potential energy is zero. This is also where it momentarily stops. So that means our kinetic energies are gonna also disappear. So we're just gonna be left with our elastic potential energy, one half k yf squared. But if this is the unstrained equilibrium point of the spring, then that's also just going to be the net amplitude of how far we've stretched the spring from its default. So we can then plug this in as our amplitude, that our amplitude is h sub zero. Pretty cool. So quite a lot of setup here, but then we arrive at a fairly simple relationship that our initial Gravitational potential energy becomes purely elastic potential energy at the end. So to finally wrap up this problem, we can take that relationship, one half K HO squared is equal to MGHO. We want to solve for HO. We will divide by K and multiply by two and divide one of these HOs out so that we're left with that the initial height is two times m times g divided by k. And that comes out to an initial height of 0.14 meters or 14 centimeters. So there's a nice demonstration of how we can once again use our conservation of mechanical energy and look at all the kinetic energies, all the potential energies, and figure out which energies we have at which points and be able to solve a problem like this.